Hey, hey, welcome to Page Break. I'm your host, Brian McClellan, coming to you as a massive winter storm drops buckets of snow on our heads in the mountains of Utah. Just a reminder that if you missed the Kickstarter for my Glass Immortals novella Montego, you can now pre-order signed card covers from my website for shipping in late May. You can also pre-order the ebook from your favorite online distributor. My guest this week is author Django Wexler. Django is probably best known to my fans as a fellow progenitor of the current flitlock fantasy subgenre with his Shadow Campaign series. He's written the Young Adult Forbidden Library series and the Wells of Sorcery. Django's newest book, Emperor of Ruin, number three in the Burning Blade and Silver Eye series, came out just last week and is available for purchase now. Django and his wife Casey also have a writing craft discussion over on their Patreon. Django and I chat about our near simultaneous start in Flintlock Fantasy and why we think the little subgenre took off when it did. We discuss Django's education and pre writing career, his work on very early artificial intelligence, and of course speculate on the exciting and sometimes scary state of AI today. Enjoy my conversation with Django Wexler. <coughs> So how how are you enjoying being a dad? Pretty well. Um, we have the best baby, uh, and <laughs> you know, I talk to other parents, and they're like, you know, it, they're, everyone's like, oh, it's so cute how everyone thinks that they have the best baby, and I say, well, but you know, our baby slept through the night, starting at three months old, and they're all like, I'm so jealous of your baby, <laughs> but she sleeps, which makes a huge difference. Um, you know, she's she's always been good about that. Um, and you know, otherwise it's been pretty fine. You know, it's, it's a little weird because we both work from home, you know, Casey is a writer and also a virtual assistant. So she does her stuff from home. And, uh, so we're always here. Um, neither one of us is sort of going off for eight hours a day. And so we trade off dealing with the baby and it's, it's fun. Yeah. Oh, good. I'm glad it's going well. You know, you know, sometimes you ask that question to a parent and they get that like, like I survived World War One look in their their face. Yeah, exactly. They're like, oh, God, the flashbacks <laughs> back to the trenches. Right. And so you, you never know how that's going to go. That would be me as a parent, which is one of the reasons I don't have children. Yeah, it's I don't know. It's not. It depends on the child. But um, I really think a lot of that comes from needing to do two things at once you know taking care of the baby is fine it's fun you know it's not that bad the problem is when you get to the point where you're like taking care of the baby and trying to accomplish something is a nightmare yeah because you know babies are babies i have so much more you know increased understanding and respect for my mom who but when i was the you know young and my brother was uh, the baby's age um she was raising us not alone but my dad did a lot of travel for his work um he was a singer and so he would be gone for months at a time um and so it'd just be her uh you know trying to raise the two of us in a third floor walk up in new york yeah well and which is yeah which is always crazy you know because like our I, i assume our parents are probably reasonably comparable ages um maybe probably and uh my i think my parents are 74 now 70 yeah about that three something like that yeah so you definitely get that that's very much still of that generation of you know the the wife stays at home with the kids and the dad goes off to whatever job that wasn't my my family is a little weird um you know my my dad was uh an opera singer who later became an executive in an investment bank and a computer programmer. And my mom was a photographer, a marketing director, and eventually switched to being a Presbyterian minister. Um, so they both had sort of very varied careers at different times during my life. Yeah. I mean, you have no idea how hard it was for me to, while you were talking respectfully about your mother for me to not say, wait a minute, tell me about your dad being a singer. <laughs> Oh, yeah, he that's, sang. Like, that's like it's such a it's such like a unique thing, right? Mm-hmm. So he he originally was going to be a math teacher. He has a degree in math from Columbia um, and then found that he hated it 
um, and he'd been in Glee Club. And so he went back to school for voice and he sang at New York City Opera for years and years um, doing opera. And then the opera season is sort of in the winter. And then the summer they go on tour with like music. He do like touring musical companies. Yeah. So, you know, I, those were the shows I mostly saw when I was a kid because um, the opera isn't that interesting, but we'd see like the set. Yeah. Um, music man or Sweeney Todd is my favorite still. Yeah. Um, and then in the nineties, he'd also just sort of always been into computers and he ended up getting a job as a computer programmer at a bank. Cause he, the travel was just sort of too much with two kids and, uh, eventually became a vice president at, uh, first Boston, just essentially through attrition. Like the, uh, <laughs> you know, he wasn't like super ambitious to like climb the corporate ladder, I think. But, um, if you were in computers in the nineties, there was a lot of places to go. And so he, he told me that like all the people in his office would like leave to go to startups. So he'd get, you know, higher and higher ranking by being the last one still at the bank. Right. Um, and so, uh, so he was eventually very successful in that, but, uh, it, it was an odd, an odd transition for him. My, one of my dad's favorite, uh, sayings is, uh, is uh I'd, I'd rather be lucky than smart it's true uh, which sometimes he really would, applies he would he was both uh but sometimes there were other times in in our life where it didn't work out i mean music is a lot of fun but it's it's you know it doesn't pay very well and it's always very you know the schedules and the rehearsals and such are exhausting so you got to really love it yeah so did, did you grow up in uh, New York City then? Kind of. So I was born in San Francisco and we moved to New York City when I was three um, and my brother was born. And so we lived in Brooklyn for another three years, but I mostly don't remember that. And then we moved to Westchester, um, to Dobbs Ferry, which is one of the sort of Hudson River towns. Yeah. Um, and I that's basically where I grew up. So if you're not from New York, these are, you know, half an hour, 45 minutes from the city, the kind of town where sort of everyone's parents work in the city pretty much. And they all sort of troop down to the train station and take the train to work. Um, and so I lived there until I went to college. I'm, I'm like 90 percent sure my uh, agent lives in Westchester, I think. Really? Maybe. That makes sense. <laughs> it's it's a it, you know, if you work in the city, it's a nice place to live. It's, you know, stereotypically, at least in that era, I think it's gotten progressively more expensive and so it's it's harder now but it was if you were living in a downtown apartment and you had kids and now you you know wanted a house with a lawn and a picket fence you'd move up to westchester and take the train for work because it was you know obviously you can't have that in manhattan yeah kind of the the american dream move kind of thing yeah yeah um and so that that's where i grew up ironically the place i live now is actually a lot like that for seattle um out here in redmond although that has also gotten too expensive to live in well that just seems like like any reasonably sized city yeah like it's just like it's not even like the even the the like because i grew up in that kind of that belt of middle class you know reasonably nice houses outside of cleveland mm -hmm. and and it's just everything unless you want to be in the boonies is too expensive these days even in cleveland really I, so i moved away from cleveland seven years ago almost and and i talked to my friends that are still living there and apparently that like because the house prices have been going up everywhere all over the u.s yeah but apparently even in cleveland which is honestly shocked me because i always yeah. thought you know, I'll be, you know, even if I move away for a while, I could probably get a house for pennies at some point if I really wanted to. Apparently I can't anymore. I had a friend. So I used to live in Pittsburgh. I went to school there and then I lived there for another five years after graduation. And I had a friend, you know, Pittsburgh, I hear has gotten better. I haven't actually been back there in 15 years, um, but it was pretty down when I lived there. And I had a friend who would buy his family bought houses and refurbished them and they bought a whole ass house for five thousand um, dollars but now when i look it's it's gone up it's expensive now yeah uh, my um my brother lived in pittsburgh with his family for just a couple of years but i remember like going house hunting with them when i was i must have been 12 or something like that um and uh because that's like pittsburgh's like two hours from where i grew up so, yeah um it, yeah we used to we had a sort of affectionate uh what's the word uh, uh deprecation of pittsburgh uh, in fact the slogan of the 
of uh, the Pittsburgh crowd was uh, Pittsburgh. The motto was, it could only be worse in Cleveland. <laughs> Which is funny because Cleveland says, at least we're not Detroit. <laughs> exactly. Oh, oh, it, it, there's a chain. I thought it was mutual. I Well, it is mutual, but I feel like the chain kind of moves sort of across the rough belt. Yeah. I mean, Pittsburgh and Cleveland, obviously... You know, they're right next to each other. They both have football teams and there's there's right, like the Browns Ravens thing and all that stuff. Pittsburgh is the Steelers. Steelers. Where is Ravens? Oh, Baltimore's yeah. Ravens. That's right. Baltimore is the Ravens. Gosh, somebody who actually knows about sports is gonna like type something angrily. This is shouting at you on the podcast. Yeah. yeah. No, the Steelers are uh, a big thing in Pittsburgh, let's say. <laughs> right. Well, it, the Browns are in Cleveland, even though they've always sucked. <laughs> the um the funniest, like, I feel bad. God, what's the Pittsburgh baseball team? I didn't know the Pits- Pittsburgh had a baseball team. They have a baseball. God, I don't remember. Anyway, they're very unpopular in Pittsburgh for the most part. Yeah. They have a big sign uh, on their scoreboard. They have a like a number that's like the number of regular season games left. But people used to joke it's a countdown to football season starting, even in the baseball stadium, because right. Pittsburgh is a football town. Uh, I was never like a football person, but man, it's uh, it's a thing. Yeah, it's funny how like those Midwest towns, especially the Rust Belt towns, they like get their claws into their local like sports teams mm. and they just. They love them so hard. The Pirates. It's the Pirates was is the Pittsburgh baseball. Team. Right, right. Yeah, it's um, just, but it's it's crazy how much because like I grew up in Cleveland and I'm not a sporty person, but like I grew up when the um, the Cleveland Indians were at their basically their height for like like eight or ten years. They were like contenders like every year, and that's but that was my teenage years basically. And so I just had to be a baseball fan, and I yeah. I, Went to games. I watched them. When I moved here to Seattle, um, I think the year before was the year that the Steelers beat the Seahawks in the Super Bowl. And so I had, there was a a period where I had to like carefully not tell people where I was from here in (laughs) Seattle because they'd be like, Pittsburgh. Right. It's always going to be a thing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Seattle is surprisingly football y. It's It's a big deal here, even. You know, because I, I think of this as not the stereotypical football town. It's sort of coastal and, and more kind of hoity-toity, but they get pretty serious about it. You see these little the 12, the, the, there's a whole thing with the 12th man as the like symbol of the the Seahawks fans and people fly flags. It's all over the buildings. It's, 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 they get, it's a big deal. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I would not have pegged C- Seattle as a sports town in general. Right. Like you asked me what Seattle's known for as like a uh, coffee. Coffee and software. Right? Yeah, coffee, Microsoft. software, and rain. Yeah, Microsoft, Amazon, and Starbucks. And and you worked at Microsoft for a while, right? I did. Um, you know, my life plan was to be a computer programmer. You know, my degree, I have a degree in creative writing, but my main degree is in um, uh, computer science. And I worked for uh, a project at um, DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Project, uh, which was at CMU, the university where I went to school. And so after I graduated, I went to work for them as a programmer doing AI research, which is not as interesting as it sounds, um, because the technology really was not there at the time. Like the thing that we were supposed to be making was basically Siri. Like it, it's pretty clear that that's what it was, although for a a military context. Yeah. Um, but this was in, you know, 2003 and the tech and resources we had were not enough. It was, it was just not there. So the thing we had never worked in any coherent way, but you know, some grad students got to write their theses, which is really the important thing. (laughs) Right. That's all that matters. Uh, and so I did that. And then when that project ended in 2007, I moved out here to Seattle with a bunch of my friends and uh, got a job at Microsoft. And I, ironically, I applied to work at Microsoft as a programmer, but they saw that I had a creative writing degree and they were like, we want you for what they call a programmer writer job, which is doing documentation for .NET, um, which is their like core programming languages. And it requires people who can both write in good English and are highly technical, not sort of like just a working knowledge and you're just going to 
you know, write a how to, but like people who really know how programming languages work internally, uh, because that's, you know, this is the sort of documentation for Uber geeks. Yeah. Um, and so it turns out if you have that skill set, there will always be jobs for you uh, because it's a very rare skill set because most programmers would rather rip their eyeballs out than write English. Yeah. In fact, we used to recruit writers and teach them to program because it was easier than the other way around. See, that, that's really interesting. It's, it's one of those weird things that this has come up on the podcast and in my private conversations with other writers and people in business and things before this idea of of communication being genuinely difficult. Like, like in my, the way my brain works, it is so much easier to write something really quickly Mm -hmm. than it is to do math or engineering or any of that stuff. Like, like I've had people try to explain programming to me and my eyes glaze over and I bleed a little out of my ears. Yeah. But like, apparently that's how a lot of people feel about like what we do for a living. It's true. Well, and there's a sort of selection effect because if you are the kind of person who finds the sort of ambiguity and sort of uncertainty of communication difficult, um, programming is very attractive because it's it's nailed down. There's you know correct ways to do things. Uh, the important thing is you have a compiler. So you write things and then you compile it. And if it's wrong, then it throws errors at you and you fix them. There's no like, oh, did I make that person angry? Or like, how do I, oh, it's the best way to write this email. Like you just do it. Um, and it just attracts people of that type. Um, I, you know, I, I have known enormous numbers of them in my school and my friends um, at people who, you know, would rather do anything than write an email. Yeah. You know, the classic example is the person who would rather write an email generating AI than write the email. Well, that's actually like, I mean, I, I not to get too topical, but like everybody is talking about act like AI yeah. today. And, and the thing I keep hearing from just, you know, the people I know that are really interested in this stuff is like, the first thing that AI is really going to do that we're looking at right now is make it so people don't have to write emails anymore. Yes. Um, No. And that's a genuinely good use of AI. If it's used for just sort of overcoming people's like emotional hangups, that's great. You know? Yeah. I definitely have friends who would much rather use chat GPT and say, Hey, write the cover letter for a resume for me to apply at Microsoft. And then the AI spits something out and they sort of correct it rather than do it. That's also happens to be what the AIs are really good at because it's like super formulaic. So like, you know, it'll do that. Although I did see a comic. I wish I had could attribute it properly, but I've forgotten where, you know, the, the AI future is like, you know, Bob says, I, AI, I want the job. Uh, write a letter and then the AI sends the email of like, dear sir or madam, I respectfully request like blah, 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 like several paragraphs. And then like on the other end, the AI says, hey, Bob wants the job, <laughs> right? Because we'll have we'll have the, the converse also. And so then we'll we'll just be, you know, computers will be sending circumlocutions to each other. Yeah, yeah. The, the AI will sum up someone else's email to you. So mm-hmm. you don't have to read all that garbage. Right. Um, and if they used an AI too, then like we could just cut the AIs out of the loop and be honest with each other. But like, who wants that? Right. And that's so being, being honest with each other is so against yeah, that. human nature. Well, I'm curious what you think of all the conversation around AI right now. Cause like, like I've got a, like, obviously it's a big conversation in the kind of like the, at least from what I see, like the Twitter art world. It's funny. I, I follow a bunch of artists on Twitter cause I love just seeing cool art in my feed all the time. But it also means that like I get the art discourse so that like this kind of exploded. Right. right. When I, um, when I was in the hospital uh, for four days, uh, this was like four or five months ago. It was like right when the conversation hit Mm -hmm. and I just very innocently happened to be like, I'm super bored in the hospital. I'm going to follow a ton of artists. And then, so, so it just filled my feed with that conversation. So I feel like my, my point of view has to be a little bit nuanced because um, I have worked on this stuff, although I don't want to claim too much expertise. Everything I worked on is so far out of date. It might as well be another century. Yeah. And, but so the tech is really interesting. Um, Chat GPT is the, the sort of text bot. And 
the really great stride forward about it is its ability to do like natural language generation is frankly fantastic. Um, I think it's very overblown in terms of some of its other capabilities. Like the best way to think of it is as a kind of natural language generator hooked up to Google and Wikipedia. Um, so if you have a problem that can be solved by a summary of a Wikipedia article, then it's fine. Um, and so like there is some genuine concern about like it be it's great for passing high school tests, right? If you need to know the causes of World War One, it will do it for you because there's an article out there that was fed into the hopper or whatever. It's not going to replace fantasy writers anytime soon. Uh, So we're safe. Really glad to hear that. (laughs) But from a sort of ethical point of view, the thing that sticks with me is we're this sort of Wild West shit where they just do the training model on literally anything they can find has got to stop. Right. Because this is much more plausible or visible on the art side where you can literally like like do this in the style of some artist and it will come back with you know a mashup of their style and like you know that's clearly you know using the training data in that way is clearly a copyright violation right and that that won't continue like there's already a dozen lawsuits um i'm sure that will get either a appropriate ruling or literally legislation. And the reason I'm sure is because the big copyright holders like Disney won't stand for it. Um, yeah. That, you know, they're the ones who have tons of IP. And like right now, if you go to mid journey and type in Spider-Man fighting Wolverine, um, you get Spider-Man fighting Wolverine and they're just, and mid journey's position is that no one owns the copyright on that. And I'm like, well, fucking good luck with that. <laughs> So I think that will will change. Um, so the, it's it's not that the tech will go away, but they they won't just be able to scrape everything, and it will be much harder to put together data sets because they'll have to get approval. Theoretically, they can work with the big stock image companies, but on the other hand, that would put the big stock image companies out of business. So they don't have a lot of incentive to work with you because that's one of the big uses, right? Like stock photo type stuff. If you need like businessman standing at a window, like that's a really easy thing to get from the thing, but it, it's definitely going to chain. We're going to have to have some revisions to like copyright law or at least court decisions that interpret it, you know, in the same way that like, you know, the concept of like likeness rights that like, if you're a, if you're a, a celebrity, the right to have something that looks like your face is a le- right that you own was like generated when that started to become a problem. And so this is not every time technology advances and times change, like new aspects of copyright and, and IP law sort of come into existence. Yeah. And, and like you mentioned, this is a, this is a place where, where some of these juggernauts that we normally would be kind of shaking our fists at, they actually have like, they've got, they've got kind of reason to, to, to say, let's hold our horses on this stuff and calm down. Yeah. And so I think we'll, you know, given it in a few years, we'll probably end up with a version of this where the training data set is quote unquote clean. So that is, they have permission to use the images in the training data set. So that will reduce some of the problems people are yelling about. Like it's being able to copy specific artists if they don't want to be part of it. Cause it's not, it's not that copying artists is unethical. It's just that if they didn't opt in or agree, then like, what are you doing? Yeah. But the notion of it taking jobs away from artists is real. And I think it's especially because it turns out there are a lot of places where we use artists, but the people commissioning don't really need art. They just need an image. Yeah. Like the classic example is the header images for like internet listicles, right? They don't, they don't need art. They need a picture of something yeah. to, to put up there. And so they don't care to sort of paraphrase a much more complicated story back in the, the old days when sort of industrial weaving was coming into, into being, you know, the, the master artisans were upset. They were like, Oh, you know, our carpets are like works of art and everything is carefully chosen. And we're, we're, we work really hard on them. And, you know, all, you know, this is all very put together and this copies the machines put out are just cheap and crappy. 
but it turned out a lot of people didn't want works of art. They wanted to keep their floors warm. Yeah. And so it's like not to run down the artistry, but rather that's like more than your average person would pay for if they got the chance. And so that's really the threat to artists where it's like, we just need a bunch of crap to hang on the walls. We don't care if it's good. And that's where the AI can come in. Hey, Page Break listeners, Brian here, rudely interrupting myself for a bit of a plug. Making a podcast isn't free, and I'm hoping that you enjoy it enough to pitch in a pittance. To do so, head on over to patreon.com slash pagebreak, where you can toss as little as $3 a month into the tip jar, $5 a month to get the podcast ad-free and early, and $10 a month to hear your name in the credits and feel a smug sense of superiority. You can also buy my books from your favorite retailer or direct from my website. Thanks to everyone who contributes. Now back to me. Well, and this is something I've I've kind of discussed privately with a couple other, a couple other authors is is that most authors would love to have concept art for their books and totally can't afford concept art for their books Mm -hmm. and there's like a there's kind of like a moral position there right because you're kind of like a mid journey sounds really cool to create concept art for my books but also i morally support artists because that's like a half a step away from what i do for a living and so you're like but also i wouldn't be paying them anyways because i can't really afford to do that very much yeah um i think that's an area where the the limitations of the ai will quickly become frustrated yeah um it's hard to control it precisely enough to to get what you want um if you have a very specific image in mind it's hard to get the ai to generate it yeah um you know it's better at spitting out this kind of average mass average stuff um so you know i i think there'll be some use there but i don't think that's like a really strong use case you know a better example would be like I have a friend who's a photographer and they love doing like, you know, like arty photos, but their bread and butter is taking pictures of planes at Boeing to hang on the walls of Boeing's headquarters. There's just like oh. pictures of planes. Yeah. Um, and, you know, if they wanted to, they could be like generate 30 different views of a Boeing 787. And the AI could probably do it. Um, and then you wouldn't have to pay somebody to go out and actually take pictures of it. Um, and it's that kind of thing. I used to do a Twitter thing where, um, hotel room art is always just like as bland as possible because they don't want to like offend anybody. So you can't have art that actually says anything. Yeah. Um, so I used to call it pictures of nothing in particular, like that would be perfect for AI. Right. Now, and, and that kind of thing kind of makes sense. Like, like you don't, you don't necessarily, you don't need an artist, whether they're an artist that's creating you know like you don't need a professional writer to write your email for you exactly um that kind of thing yeah it's like we don't care what it is we just know that a room should have like a picture on the wall yeah and it should be bland and inoffensive and and nobody's gonna look at it very long right it'll register in their periphery for you know two seconds and that's it um no it it does make sense It, it it's just it's kind of an interesting thing and and I like I confess to being slightly terrified of the whole AI advance because like you already made reference to, I don't want to be out of a job in 10 years. No. Yeah. Yeah. It's tricky. Um, and they're already, you know, people are already going to be spamming Amazon Kindle with this. Yeah. I wrote a fantasy novel and, you know, combined with the kind of barriers to gatekeeping it or the lack of barriers rather it's, um, it's a problem and it's a problem for readers too because it's it makes it very easy to completely flood the zone with low quality content yeah. which is a kind of tragedy of the commons like you may get a few bucks from people accidentally clicking but like when everyone does it collectively then it means that you know the the whole store is now a sea of crap well and that's that's a problem with amazon not just in the writing world like like they talk about like i see articles about how amazon is just nowadays is just flooded with the cheapest kind of crap that you know like algorithms say 
oh, you know, 40,000 people bought this particular dog toy. Let's figure out how to make it for half the price and sell it. Yeah. And, and that happens across the entire spectrum of the crap that we order for our daily lives. Yeah. No, it's they had to introduce that whole like Amazon's choice marker, which I think partly is just like, let's pop something to the top of the search. That is what most people want. Like if you want like a dog bowl, like here's our, here's yeah. a good one. Um, yeah, it, it's tricky. I mean, it's related to how social media works. Like I used to say the first law of social media is that any unmoderated space becomes toxic. And I think the first, a similar law in marketplaces is like, if it's possible to spam the marketplace, then eventually someone will do it. And like, yeah, there has to be some way, but the the interesting thing, and this is a technology side that I don't know much about, is that the search engines don't appear to be able to keep up, right? Like Amazon search doesn't appear to be able to consistently surface the good stuff against the spam. Yeah, which is definitely like a, it feels like one of those like problems that it feels like it it probably should be bigger but like a bigger deal but but honestly you know a lot of these like like amazon why do they care i mean they they have a they have a tendency to not care about Mm -hmm. details like that well i mean they make money when the crap gets sold so right you know they're the whole point of their system is that they can be kind of agnostic to what sells on the marketplace because they get their cut regardless so they don't have to monitor it um because that costs money, you see. Right, right. And we we have a, a very small window into that with, you know, them buying Goodreads. Like, yeah. Goodreads, it's it's just such a trash pile. And it would be, it to us, it seems like that would be so easy for them to make it into this great little place. And they don't care. Yeah, yeah. Um, that was, when they bought Goodreads, I was like, ooh, maybe it'll get better. And they're like, no, that we just, we just bought it for the data. Um, <laughs> right. But we can't even... St- you know, I always feel weird speaking against Amazon because, man, they're where my books sell. Yeah, it's it's hard. There's no there's there's no way around it. Right. That's, you know, they're the big deal. And, um, you know, if you're in the self-pub side of the world, that's even more true. Uh, so, yeah, I don't know. I always think like, you know, as evil corporations go, Amazon, you know, at least they give me something for their for being evil like they have convenient service i you know i love getting things the next day it's like you know you know exxon Mobil or comcast or whatever it's like oh god you're just the worst and you're you know you don't provide anything useful right you're you're the worst and i have to pay you because you're the only service exactly you're you're just like a horrible gatekeeper sitting collecting rent right it's it's a weird like it's such a weird, like kind of thing to try to try to parse out morally um, because it's exhausting. You know, you, you think about these things and, and I think the average person just in general, no matter what their kind of credo is, is probably, I would rather not support these massive mega corporations, but you have no choice. You don't have a choice. So the thing I have come to believe is that I mean, this is a mix of of personal belief and uh, things that are actually true. Um, your personal choices are not very important. Um, and the whole concept of thinking about these things in terms of personal choice is actually a red herring. Um, the mantra is there's no substitute for policy, right? And in some cases, it's literally true that corporations encourage the idea of thinking about it in terms of personal choices this is for like environmentalism and like like oh you know well this will be organic or this will be such and such free and you know you can choose what you want at the grocery store and that's your way of contributing because getting people to think about it that way is so much better for them than if they were regulated more right um uh, what they don't want is people writing to their congressmen saying, you got to do something about this company or that company. Um, and so, you know, it's frustrating because I feel like we've collectively kind of lost faith in government um, in the last, you know, few years for some reason. <laughs> uh, but like we have a means of collective action and it's called government and we just have to use it. Um, the no amount of like, you know, oh, I'm going to, you know, when I can avoid using this company's services is going to make a difference. 
like because that's not the same as a boycott, like a sort of tightly targeted boycott of a specific company for a specific reason can move the needle, but just sort of a general like, oh, I'm going to avoid Amazon or whatever. So the caveat there is that it's very hard to hurt the mega corporations, but it's very easy to help businesses that you like by giving them your custom. So if you have like a local bookstore, definitely go there and shop if you can, because like the $25 that you don't spend at Amazon, they don't care. But like the twenty five dollars that you can spend at a mom and pop shop makes a difference to them. Yeah, yeah, and it makes sense. And it's uh, it's it's one of those things that I I try to like I try to think about this like really um generously in terms of the way that modern just humans are trying to navigate the the world now. It's so much information, and it's so many things bombarding you from all sides that. You can forgive people for not yeah. really grasping a lot of these topics and engaging with them. Well, and that that's the other sort of corollary of this this sort of rejection of the kind of like individual choice is super important attitude is like just don't worry about it that much. Like the level of worry that we put into something should be commensurate with its effect. And since the effect is like super, super tiny, like it's fine. Like just buy the shit from Amazon if it delivers faster. Like nobody, yeah. nobody cares. Um, well, and 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 you can buy the things from Amazon, but also vote in a way that yeah tries to maybe get Amazon dismantled or restricted or something. Right, huge difference. Yeah, if you can, you know, if you have a store that you really like and you would like them to remain in business, it behooves you to spend your money there. Absolutely, but like apart from that, um, so I. I, I had a I had a question for you about I feel like your uh you know, now that we've talked about tech stuff for the last you know forty minutes yeah I feel like <laughs> your whole your kind of career and life path should have put you into writing science fiction so where did you end up with epic fantasy yes um it's a good question um because when I was when I was a kid science fiction was my jam um you know I grew up reading classic SF, you know, Asimov and Clark and Bradbury and all that stuff. Um, you know, that, you know, David Brin and, you know, Larry Niven and Jerry Pornell and, you know, all these kind of things. So I read fantasy, but the, but the SF was really my thing. Um, and it kind of transitioned as I got older oddly you know what by the time i was in college i was reading a lot more fantasy um my interest had sort of shifted and i don't know why i think part of it was i got more into like longer novels and series the kind of sf i'd always liked had mostly been in short stories um like i've always said like if you want if you want to understand like golden age sf you have to read short fiction and not novels because a lot of the novels are sort of dull and didactic um like isaac asimov people are like oh go read foundation and i'm like go, go you know foundation's fine i i found it a little on the dull side but like go read a collection of asimov stories like it's great he's funny um the characters are memorable you know that was his his forte is this short story and like at the time that was the important part um Novels were like a weird afterthought because you could actually make money at short fiction, unlike today. Um, but basically, I got into reading more modern stuff and I got into reading novels and I got really into like, you know, uh, George R. R. Martin and Stephen Erickson, Wheel of Time. And um, that stuff was about when I started writing my own novels, basically. Um, I think also once I started writing, I was more comfortable in novels than i was in short fiction short fiction is hard that's still true um i'm better at it than i was then but it's still hard yeah um so yeah i mean you know and some of it's just happenstance like the the book that I, the first book that i sold is a fantasy because i had basically you know my my concept was i want to do game of thrones but in the napoleonic era um that would you know that's what it came down to like i had read game of thrones i was like this is awesome and i liked the like sort of bringing the kind of knights and castles fantasy towards its historical roots in you know england and scotland 
And I'm like, I'd love to do something like this, but in a kind of different historical era. And then I read a Napoleon book and I was like, this is the one, this is what I want to do. Um, so that sort of, because of that, it's fantasy. I'm actually, I can't really go into detail because I don't think we've been announced yet, but I do have a science fiction project coming up. Oh, very cool. More novels. Um, so I'll get there. But yeah, it, it you would think that, that I would be. It's not uncommon, though. Like, a lot of tech guys are fantasy nerds. Yeah. You know, you'd think that all the computer guys would be all science fiction, but, like, everybody back in school was reading Game of Thrones and the big fantasy doorstops. We all play D&D, too. Uh, I think there's maybe something there of of wanting to do something that's not exactly like what you do for a living. Yeah, I think that's true. You know, like, if you're a nerd, if you're a reader... And you already work in tech. Yeah. Maybe you don't want to spend your free time fiddling with, you know, tech worlds, you know, tech worlds. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I wonder how much of it is about fantasy gaming, too. Like we all play D&D and that kind of informs, you know, like that's how I got my start writing basically was like I was DMing for role playing games and I wanted to do something more complicated than I could actually do. I feel like I got my start like almost with uh, um, uh, Warcraft orcs and humans. Like, oh, yeah. The very first Warcraft. I used to play that with my friend Graham. It was the first like online multiplayer I had ever done. I guess maybe I was in a mud before that. But like I would literally just dial his house with the modem and we just connect directly to each other. Rather, There was no matchmaking or any of that. And this was like, you know, mind blown. I was like 12. Yeah. I, I remember being a, just a little tiny kid and my brother and I were, um, I think we were visiting my sister at college where my uncle taught. And so he had access to the computer lab and he showed us, he, he brought us in and showed us how they had like 12 computers all hooked together to play Doom on. Oh yeah. And and that did, that blew my mind at like just absolutely like, Really? This is the height of technology. This is amazing. Absolutely. Uh, we did we did a lot of that stuff when I when I finally got to college, the uh the computer clusters late at night were like our Unreal Tournament, you know, slash Quake Three um centers. It was a lot of shenanigans. Yeah, yeah. I uh I was curious if you have any thoughts on this, because I've I've discussed this with other writers uh, on the podcast and stuff like that. Um you and I are kind of known for being at the forefront of this little tiny uh, um, subgenre of Beckwith fantasy, mm -hmm. Flintlock fantasy. Mm -hmm. And you and I came out at almost the exact same time. Like, honestly, they could have shuffled our release dates and you would have come out before me. And like, it was like three months apart. Yeah, it was weird. Uh, you know, I feel like we've been kind of joined at the hip in some sense because it's because of that coincidence well so something that strikes me is that if you talk to an older fantasy author they will all inevitably be like oh i wrote some flintlocky fantasy back in the 80s and it yeah nobody liked it and and i'm curious what you think wh why you think that this actually became a subgenre now well now meaning 2013 yeah um, rather than, you know, back in the nineties or whatever, when, you know, these books were coming out, but nobody got onto them. Um, I think there's a few explanations. I mean, the first thing I would say is I don't think it's Flintlock specifically. My sort of glib initial explanation would be that fantasy took a long time to emerge from the shadow of Tolkien that Tolkien was so popular and so formative for a huge number of people. And then after that, Tolkien and a few other things kind of got mushed together in D&D. &D. And D&D, &D, the sort of first wave of D&D, &D was so formative for a huge number of people that it was... You know, fantasy, that's what fantasy was. It was Tolkien and Dungeons and Dragons. And so something that wasn't that world of, you know, orcs and elves and dwarves and castles and knights and stuff. I mean, you know, the the three threads that, that I like to trace are Tolkien, D&D, &D, and um, Arthuriana, but specifically the Once a Future King, because that gives us the kind of like 
orphan farm boy who turns out to be the chosen one right is the is the king arthur story and so you know tolkien plus once a future king equals wheel of time right the yeah. the farm boy who is secretly the chosen one must take the thing to the dark mountain to defeat the incarnation of evil right like that's that's you know every 80s fantasy and so we had a lot of that and i feel like it wasn't until the 90s when we started to get away from it and again like you were saying i don't want to imply that no one was writing that stuff because people have been writing different interesting stuff all along but it didn't become popular you know the, yeah. the readership wasn't there um and as a result the publishers weren't super keen on it but in the 90s you know people started to do grim dark and that was, you know, sort of very clearly a reaction to the kind of Tolkienian fantasy. And then I think it just, we got to a kind of broadening of what fantasy can be about. So I think it's not so much like people got super into flintlocks for some reason, as people got to a point where not everything had to be in the D&D world. Yeah, because there's there's sort of other types of fantasy. That's also when like urban fantasy became really popular. and you know, sort of other branches of that fantasy tree started spreading. So like secondary worlds that weren't knights and castles became a thing. And, you know, obviously that as a flintlock thing, that's what we were writing. Yeah. I, I wonder if we kind of snuck in to kind of the gap left by, from what I understand that, uh, um, steampunk had a big kind of surge yeah and then not long before you and i kind of came onto the scene steampunk kind of died yeah that's that's true and i wonder if we kind of slipped into that yeah i think that's true that's a good point because uh, i know that when i was trying to pitch when i was pitching to publishers and when i was trying to pitch my book to people i tried really hard to say this is definitely epic fantasy it's just a little different than what you think of it. No, same. You know, I was always using George R. R. Martin as, as a comp and people were like, oh, so it's like steampunk. And I'm like, no, 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 it's not steampunk because there's no steam. There's no steam engine. There's no industrial revolution. It's not any of that. People get forgiven for not knowing like that much about history. And there's like, there's this long period where we had cannons and muskets, but not steam engines and trains. But uh, gunpowder, that's the other thing is like actual history doesn't line up with people's expectations like the my favorite example is the world of D, &D the world that has no gunpowder mostly but has like full plate armor and so fully armored lancers never yeah. existed right like cannons in europe predate the the sort of full plate harness that we think of as like the jousting knight so there never was a world where, you know, Lancelot didn't coexist with canon. Except when Sir Thomas Mallory wrote Mort d'Arthur, that was the world he wrote about, was, you know, knights armored as though they were in the present day, but there were no guns because it was theoretically in the mythic past. Um, and that's kind of come down to fantasy, but it's not real. Yeah, it, and it's, it is interesting because most people don't realize that there was hundreds of years where archers supported cannons like right. uh, you know to somebody who's kind of especially if you're raised on medieval epic fantasy that concept makes your brain kind of short out no they had cannons you know the hundred years war had cannons in it you know famous english longbow victories at cressy and agincourt i don't know if they were specifically at that battlefield but during that time period there were definitely cannons introduced and used and it overlaps more than you think. And then also people tend to skip the whole pike phase, the whole uh, pike and, well, first pike and then pike and shot, where like, you know, the Swiss were kicking ass and, you know, big pike blocks ruled the battlefield. That whole era just gets kind of elided. We go basically from, you know, dudes in full armor to three musketeers overnight. I think that there's an element there where to the average person, a guy with some armor and a sword looking in the eyes of his enemy. It's really romantic, but like a whole bunch of dudes from like their farms carrying spears, which is what most of combat in history was like, that's not very romantic. People also underestimate 
like just how bad the early guns were. And it, it seems like, well, obviously once they have guns, who's going to like, you know, ride around on, on horses or like have wear armor. And it's like a lot of the early gunpowder weapons were actually worse than the bows and crossbows. Um, it, there's a whole story. Yeah. And and there's like, there's like a psychological element that, that we never talk about because you and I, as modern people are, we're used to loud sounds. We're used to being bombarded by sensations. Yeah. If you take a whole bunch of people with early muskets, you know, essentially what are early muskets and put them on a battlefield, the sound and the, the sight of the powder smoke, it's far more like the, the amount of psychological damage that does is probably a lot more than the physical damage it does. Yeah. Oh yeah. No, it's, it's a whole thing, but you know, that's, part of what makes it fun for me right like going and mining from history is fun because you can uh, surprise people right you can you can be like oh this is this is how it actually was and i can put this in my story and it's not what everyone thinks of yeah yeah and and i love that and i think that's what i think that's something that kind of the whole little subgenre of flintlock fantasy has done is that it's kind of scratched that itch for a lot of people of of giving something a little bit new to the thing that they grew up reading. And that, you know, I, I like that. It's funny though, when I was writing thousand names and its sequels, I knew that I was going to have to sneak a kind of tutorial on Napoleonic warfare into the book because, you know, people have a sort of basic understanding of how, you know, a joust works or how a sword fight works, or at least they think they do. But like most people don't even have like kind of an idea of how a musket battle works. So like there's early scenes where we go through a loading drill and, you know, to show like what it is, you know, you rip the the cartridge open and all that and like forming square against cavalry and why this is a good idea and stuff like that. And so like, you know, it's there's a little more explanation required than there might be if it's like, okay, we're going at these orcs with with our swords. Right. Right. It's uh, you, you've got to kind of you've got to ease the reader into something that it may be new to them. But that's that's kind of a challenge for any writer, especially when you're writing, you know, fantasy, science fiction. Yeah, or, it's kind of the big the big difference. Right. Like if you're writing in a contemporary world, you have a lot of assumed knowledge you can rely on. People know what a car is. So like if someone's driving a car down a street at 100 miles an hour and someone's chasing them, like we understand the stakes. We understand this is like too fast and so on like nobody has to explain that to us because it's just like a thing in our culture but like yeah the same situation you know if someone's flying their hover car down a street at 100 miles an hour is that fast is it slow i don't know depends how the hover cars work <laughs> no i love it well i um I, i've kept you for quite a long time but i like to end every episode by asking each of my guests What's the last thing that you ate that blew your mind? The last thing that I ate that blew my mind. Well, I have been baking bread because I am consistently two or three years late to trends. <laughs> um, but uh, so I have been baking bread from the book Flour, Water, Salt, East, which was very popular. Um, my dad used to use it and I've been doing it. And it's been really good. Like, it's one of those things where just like, like, I'm, it's not. You know, I'm not the best at it, obviously. I've only been doing it for a few weeks, but like the fresh stuff is so good compared to like what you can get at a store, you know, not to run down, you know, they do their best, but like, you know, the fresh bread doesn't have like all the compromises you have to make to stay good for a week and a half. You know, it goes stale in two days, but it's okay because I eat it by then. And so doing that and then eating it, you know, my lunch for the last week has been like slices of fresh bread with salami and brie and it's just like that's it's heaven oh i love fresh bread so much i uh i it's just it's like one of those it's it's such a simple pleasure like but it can be so good i i feel like terrible about it because like my wife went to paris for the art and she we spent days going to museums i went there for the stupid bakery that we went to every single morning yeah Oh, I'm sure. So France is amazing. It was just divine. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I recommend if you are a person who, like me and presumably like you, is working at home and just kind of stays home all day, look into like like the kind of bread they talk about in this book, um, flour, water, salt, yeast, is 
very low effort, but it takes a long time. Mm -hmm. Um, It's sort of long fermentation rising, but no kneading um, because you start with very little yeast, blah, blah, blah. He explains it in the book. But the gist is, if you're the kind of person who can take 15 minutes off at any time during the day to move the bread to the next step, you can have fresh bread every day with like almost no effort. You just put it in the bin and you mix it and then you just leave it for 15 hours and you bake it the next morning. It's obviously if you're a person who has to go work in an office all day, then like it's much harder. Um, But it's sort of taking advantage of what we do for a living. Right, right. And uh, this is reminding me I need to uh, check and see if my sourdough starter is still alive. Oh, yeah. (laughs) It's been sitting at the back of my fridge for months. You can make a new one. It's not that hard. It takes like a week. Yeah. But yeah, so that's that's been my like weird little hobby project for the last couple of weeks. Um, no, the, that's great. The baby likes it, too. So that's all good. 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 Did you watch? Um, I don't know if you, you saw, especially I think he was doing it a lot more during the pandemic. But Brad Bullier was like posting photos of the baking he was doing constantly. Oh, yeah. Oh, my gosh. Like he genuinely seemed to have a talent for that. Yeah. No, it's um, I've seen a bunch of stuff like two years ago. So I again, you know. But it makes yeah. sense, right? That was the time when everyone was at home all the time. And it, yeah, it <laughs> makes sense is a thing to do. Right. That was author Django Wexler. You can find links to Django's website and social media down in the show notes. You can find me, as always, at brianmcclellan.com. Special thanks to James Sutter for music and Tom Bishop for production. If you'd like to support the podcast, head on over to patreon.com slash pagebreak or buy my books in ebook, paperback, or audio. You can also get signed copies of my books direct from my website or swag from my Redbubble store. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and leave a review. If you're listening to this via Patreon, please stick around for bonus chat during the epilogue. Special thanks to Elijah, Ivor Gulickson, James Clark, Jennifer Johnson, Jason Knoll, Kyle Anderson, Sexton Hardcastle, Talon, Brian, Will Lebelski, and Bradley Thornhill for their backing on Patreon. <laughs> <laughs>